Good evening. My name is Gay Yuan, and I'm chair of the boards of the Friends of the Chinese American Museum. I'd like to welcome you to this night's um, programming. This is the second of a series of eight programs designed and put on by the Chinese American Museum and many of our partners to commemorate the Chinese massacre of 1871. While we are coming together these next few days to remember a heinous event in LA, let us use the telling of this story today and in the days to come as a stimulus to change and how our histories are being told from this point on. We started out with a uh, performance yesterday to kick off the eight days of programming and um, the program will culminate on the actual day of the 150th anniversary of the Chinese massacre on Sunday, October 24th. All, our, all of our programming will be available to you virtually and we hope that you will join us as we try to right some wrongs that are part of our history. Before we start, I want to acknowledge that this virtual event is taking place across the continent of North America, also known as Turtle Island. Original and unceded territories of hundreds of sovereign indigenous people and nations. We acknowledge and honor the original caretakers of the various places our speakers are joining us from. Today, I am joining you from downtown Los Angeles in the facilities of the Chinese American Museum, physically located in the historic village site of Yangna in the Tobangar, unceded traditional territories of the Gabrielino, Shoshone, Kitsch, and Tongva, indigenous people of these lands. To this day, there are at least seven tribes of Gabrielino peoples who maintain an ongoing presence, power, and relations among their peoples, their natural relations and the lands they belong to. I invite you to remember the indigenous peoples who affirm their sovereignty and ongoing relations with the lands you currently occupy and ask yourselves, how do you, your people or your organization honor these relatives? The Chinese American Museum opened its doors in 2003 after nearly 20 years of community fundraising and public and private support. We're located in downtown Los Angeles in the historic Garnier building across the street from what is now Union Station. CAM's mission is to research, preserve, and share the history, the rich cultural legacy, and the continued contributions of Chinese in America. We achieve these goals through our permanent and temporary exhibitions, educational tours, workshops, community engagement, and programs such as this one. Every year since 2010, CAM has marked the anniversary of this somber moment in American history known as the Chinese Massacre of 1871. The lives that were tragically lost has really not been acknowledged or identified until CAM started year annually to commemorate this horrible piece of history in Los Angeles. In tonight's program, our panelists will discuss the history of the massacre in depth and provide historical context about the social and economic state of Los Angeles and the nation 
in the late 1800s. Before we move on to our programming and our panelists, here are some things that you need to know before we begin our program. The program is being recorded and may be made public for viewing in the future. Please keep your microphones and videos off for the duration of the program. At the end of the program, we'll take a group photo. At this point, CAM staff will provide instructions for you to turn on your video for those who wish to participate in the picture taking. For the best experience, we ask that you watch on speaker view. The chat box is currently unavailable. However, if you need assistance, you may send a private chat to the host Chinese American Museum. I'd like to begin now by introducing you to our distinguished panel of speakers. These experts made time to be with us tonight so that they can lay the foundations and contribute to our understanding of what happened leading up to October 24th, 1871, and then subsequently what happened after that. Panelist Kevin White is an assistant professor of history at Durham University in Great Britain and author of West of Slavery, The Southern Dream of a Transcontinental Empire. With funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, he co-directed a collaborative research grant on the life and times of Biddy Mason, a Georgia slave turned California real estate entrepreneur. His writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The Los Angeles Times, National Geographic, Huffington Post, The New Republic, The Washington Post, among many others. Kevin is unable to join us live for this panel tonight as he's living in the UK, but he will be participating via a pre-recorded video presentation that he had prepared especially for this program. Our old friend Eugene Moy is the unofficial supreme historian of Los Angeles Chinatown. He has been involved with public history for decades. He is an active member of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, the Friends of the Chinese American Museum, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, and other community organizations, which he often was instrumental in establishing. He's a native of Los Angeles Chinatown, a graduate of California State University, Long Beach, and he retired after 35 years in municipal planning. Our next friend we're going to introduce is Scott Zesh. Scott is the author of The Chinatown War, Chinese Los Angeles and the Massacre of 1871, which was described in the New Republic as an excellent study of race relations in frontier Los Angeles. According to the Los Angeles Times, Scott Scott's book skillfully tells the story of a massacre of Chinese immigrants in 1871, providing a quote, powerful account of a largely forgotten incident that questions whether the right lessons have been learned. His article on the early Chinese community in Los Angeles and the race riot and the massacre of 1871 was published in Southern California Quarterly in 2008 that writing received the Carl I. Wheat Award for the best article to appear in that publication over a five year period of time. So I know you can't clap for our panel um, of speakers, but we do welcome them. And I'm going to turn now uh, the mic over to the first speaker, which is Mr. Scott Zesch. Thank you, Gay, for that kind introduction. I'd like to thank the museum for hosting these virtual events and for inviting me to participate. And while I have the chance, I'd also like to publicly thank 
my fellow panelist, Eugene Moy, who was my go-to person in Los Angeles from the time I started this research in 2005. This evening, I'm going to touch briefly on three topics. The first is the social and racial climate of Los Angeles in the years preceding the Chinese massacre. Second, I'll give an overview of what happened on the night of October 24th. And finally, I'll summarize the court proceedings that came out of the massacre. Los Angeles in 1870 was a wild west town of only 5,700 people. Most Americans outside of California had never heard of it. Californians knew about Los Angeles mainly because of its reputation for violence. It was called the toughest town in the entire nation, a place that attracted rootless drifters and hot-headed young thugs. This was an era of sheer recklessness and plain disregard for human life. Minor disputes were often settled with guns and knives. This recklessness wasn't limited to any one segment of the population. It pervaded every level of society. Even some of the town's most prominent residents were quick to draw weapons and challenge each other to duels. Los Angeles had the state's highest per capita murder rate in the 1850s and 1860s. These frequent killings prompted some people to take the law into their own hands. As a result, Los Angeles also had the highest number of lynchings in California. The so-called vigilance committees hanged nearly 50 suspects in the two decades before the Chinese massacre. The town's first Chinese residents settled in the roughest neighborhood of an unusually rough town. The rents there were cheap, and the Chinese workers were trying to save money to send home. Calle de los Negros, the short street that ran through the Chinese quarter, was known as the Five Points or Barbary Coast of Los Angeles. Its saloons and brothels drew hoodlums and toughs who were spoiling for a fight. Many Angelinos were afraid to walk through that neighborhood even in the daytime. Calle de los Negros was located between the old plaza and the town's principal business district. Even though Los Angeles was home to fewer than 200 Chinese in 1870, they were highly visible to the larger population because of the downtown location of the Chinese Quarter. At first, non-Asian residents took a live and let live attitude toward the Chinese among them. The press coverage of events in the Chinese community ranged from neutral to somewhat positive. Affluent Angelinos sought to hire Chinese men to work in their houses, vineyards, and orchards. They also bought vegetables from Chinese peddlers, took their clothes to Chinese laundries, and consulted Chinese physicians, such as Dr. Jean Tong. Things started to change notice, noticeably in 1869, when a Los Angeles newspaper launched a series of vitriolic editorials denigrating Chinese immigrants as animals who lived in dens, filthy and disgusting, an inferior and idolatrous race, and a foul blot upon our civilization. This hate mongering was the work of white labor proponents who wanted to expel Chinese immigrants from the country. Around that same time, violent and unprovoked attacks on the Chinese residents of Los Angeles started to rise sharply. 
Meanwhile, far too many non-Asian Angelinos reacted to these anti-Chinese incidents with apathy and even laughed them off. Most influential citizens remain silent, choosing not to speak out against the hateful racist attacks, both in the press and on the streets. In doing so, they helped foster an atmosphere of indifference in which the mob of October 24th would later carry out its crimes. I've painted a pretty dire picture of Los Angeles in the years before the massacre, but some positive developments were also happening. The Chinese, more than any other recent immigrants to the area, learn to use the American legal system to redress some of the wrongs committed against them. They brought small claims seeking unpaid wages, unpaid laundry bills, and overcharges by landlords. A blatantly racist California statute prohibited Chinese from testifying against whites, but that didn't stop them from going to court if they could prove their cases using other evidence. Even though some of the people the Chinese sued were prom prominent citizens of Los Angeles, the Chinese plaintiffs won a large majority of these lawsuits. The Chinese community of Los Angeles was small in 1870, but its small size didn't mean that all of its people were united. Regional differences that divided people in the homeland resurfaced in California. Their disputes were also rooted in commerce and personal animosity. Business was highly competitive in the Chinese quarter. The Chinese merchants had not succeeded in attracting a very large non-Asian clientele, so they tried all sorts of tactics to gain more patronage from their own countrymen. By 1870, the neighborhood was witnessing an all out power struggle as the leaders of two Chinese factions competed for dominance. In March, 1871, seven months before the massacre, members of one faction abducted the beautiful young wife of a prosperous merchant and forced her to marry one of their own men. This event caused a huge uproar in the Chinese community and tensions continued to simmer throughout the summer of 1871. By October, the leaders of the other faction decided it was time to settle the score. They recruited some professional gunmen from San Francisco. Shortly before sundown on October 24th, a gunfight broke out between several members of the two Chinese factions. Local lawmen and curiosity seekers rushed to the neighborhood to see what was going on. In the confusion, they started firing haphazardly at the Chinese buildings. Some Chinese returned the gunfire from inside. A white resident approached the open doorway of a Chinese store even though police officers warned him to get back. He stood in the door and fired two random shots into the dark room for no apparent reason. Now, that seemed like a suicidal act in the heat of this gun battle, but this type of reckless behavior was common in Los Angeles at the time. The white man was hit by return fire and died shortly afterwards. Within an hour, hysterical rumors had circulated through Los Angeles that the Chinese were killing the white men by wholesale. As darkness fell, an angry mob of Anglo and Latino men started to grow in the Chinese quarter. The crowd was roughly estimated at 500, about one-tenth of the town's population but no one really knows how big it was. What's significant is that this mob, 
had the Chinese buildings surrounded. The sheriff might have used his limited forces to break up the crowd and close off this area before things turn ominous. Instead, he was so intent on arresting the Chinese gunman that he told the crowd not to let anyone escape from the buildings. Both he and the city marshal actually told bystanders to shoot any Chinese who tried to flee. With these orders, they sealed the fate of the innocent Chinese trapped inside their homes and shops. By a quarter till nine, after a three hour standoff, the police were no longer able to hold back the large unruly crowd. The mob's leaders battered their way into the Coronel Adobe, the main building that the Chinese leased. The rooms in this old adobe house were connected by interior doors. So it was easy for the mob to gain access to the entire premises. The scene that followed inside the Coronel Adobe was horrifying and chaotic. Bloodthirsty men poured through the building. They threatened police officers and any citizens who tried to stop them. They kicked, beat, shot, and stabbed the Chinese occupants, and they plundered and destroyed their property. They put ropes around several men's necks and started dragging them to, through the streets to three different lynching sites downtown. The ringleaders were jovial as they carried out their grisly work. They actually seemed to enjoy it. At Tomlinson's corral, the mob members amused themselves by pulling on a hanging rope so that one victim's head smashed against a crossbeam repeatedly. The rioters thought that they could get away with it because they were so many. They also knew that their fellow Angelinos didn't seem to care much about what happened to the Chinese. In little more than half an hour, the mob brutally tortured and murdered 18 Chinese. 15 died by hanging and another three were shot. One victim was the town's most popular Chinese physician, a married man in his early 30s known as Jean Tong. Another was a 15-year-old boy. There's no record of how many other Chinese were badly wounded during the riot. Some victims were captured on the streets. They were just returning home from work and didn't even know a gun battle had taken place earlier in the evening. A few non-Asians tried to stop the mob and several potential Chinese victims were rescued and taken to safe locations. Otherwise, the massacre toll could have easily climbed much higher. Of the 18 who died at the hands of the mob, only one was believed to have taken part in the gunfight that preceded the massacre. The other 17 were trapped in the wrong place at the wrong time. The killing spree of October 24th was the bloodiest attack on Chinese immigrants that the nation had experienced at that time. The Chinese massacre was also the first event to draw nationwide attention to Los Angeles. It was a public relations disaster for the city, whose civic boosters were careful to downplay the massacre in the years to come. Nonetheless, the city's leaders knew that there had to be a reckoning because the eyes of the nation were on them. The Los Angeles grand jury returned indictments against 37 of the mob members. 25 were indicted for murder and another 12 for lesser crimes. 10 men were brought to trial. 
No one knew how these trials would turn out. It was hard for the prosecutor to get eyewitnesses to testify because they were afraid of retaliation by the mob members and their friends. It was also a challenge finding unbiased jurors. Still, eight of the 10 defendants were convicted. Their sentences ranged from two to six years. Seven of them were sent to San Quentin immediately, while the eighth was released pending his appeal. The sentences were so light because the eight ringleaders were convicted of manslaughter rather than murder. Manslaughter seems like a woefully inadequate way to characterize the vicious murders that occurred on October 24th. What happened in the first trial was that 11 of the jurors voted for a murder conviction, but one juror held out. The other 11 decided to compromise on a manslaughter verdict. If they hadn't done this, and the case had resulted in a mistrial, it's possible that none of the rioters ever would have been held accountable. The following year, the California Supreme Court overturned the eight convictions on a technicality. After studying this case carefully, it's hard to see this reversal as anything other than a gross miscarriage of justice. Nonetheless, the Los Angeles judiciary was not to blame for this appalling outcome. In fact, the town's judges, lawyers, and juries had done their jobs surprisingly well under difficult circumstances. There would be no more lynchings in the city of Los Angeles after October 24th as mob rule finally gave way to the rule of law. A couple of other interesting developments also came out of the riot trials. In the prosecution of two of the Chinese gunmen, Chinese testimony was allowed for the first time in Los Angeles's district court. Later, some Chinese store owners sued the city for failing to prevent the destruction of their property during the riot. A lawyer for the city objected to the testimony of one of the firm's partners on the ground that Chinese were not allowed to testify against whites. The judge very sensibly concluded that the racially diverse city of Los Angeles was not a white person. The same judge also ruled that anti-Chinese sentiment was a relevant factor in selecting the jurors who would decide the fate of the mob members. Through all these developments, the local judiciary reminded non-Asian Angelinos that the Chinese immigrants among them were fellow human beings. This evening, I'd like to remember some of those fellow human beings by reading one of the last paragraphs of my book. Only bits and pieces of their stories remain, but that is enough. Jean Tong and his wife doted on their poodle. Tong Wan was a musician, popular at socials. Ah Wan sported a flashy diamond ring he had purchased with his savings. Hua Sing Kwai had lived on Calle de los Negros for five years. He must have known the inside story about everything that happened there. Ah Long and Ah Cut provided small pleasures, cigars and liquor, to those toiling in a harsh environment. Wing Chi had cooked a sumptuous feast that afternoon with an abundance of Chinese delicacies for his company's headmen. He would not live to receive their compliments. Teenager Ah Lu had just arrived from China, eager to scale the heights of Gold Mountain. So many American dreams died on the gallows that night. If there are lessons to be learned from the Chinese massacre, the most obvious one 
is the danger of remaining silent while hate crimes and hate speech go unchecked. A second lesson, perhaps not so obvious, is that even an atrocity as horrible as the Chinese massacre doesn't automatically bring about a change in people's attitudes. In the decade that followed the massacre, prominent Angelinos continued to remain silent and allowed anti-Chinese sentiment to grow, culminating in the Exclusion Act of 1882. This disheartening development serves as a reminder that creating a climate of racial tolerance and respect for human rights requires the diligent effort and active participation of many people. It doesn't just happen on its own. Thank you, Gay. I'll pass back to you now. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I want our audience to know that after the speakers finish presenting, uh, we're going to have a chance, uh, first of all, to have the three of them talk to each other to extend some of the points that they've made. And then also there will be a Q&A period um, later on so that we can address some of your questions or your issues uh, in tonight's presentation. So now I'd like to uh, reintroduce you to Eugene Moy, our uh, Chinatown godfather in Los Angeles. Eugene? Hi, thank you, Gay, and I uh, appreciate the, uh, all the background from Scott. Uh, he's actually the, the real scholar because he spent a lot of hours uh, going through the LA City archives and at the Huntington Library, going through court records to really try and get at the real story behind the this um, significant event in LA's history. And you know, there's no question that it was one of the uh, it was an incident of, of true blight in our history, and it's something that we're still trying to um, trying to address at, at this time 150 years later anyway I, i'm going to comment a little bit on the background of the chinese american community um, chinese have been coming into the americas for centuries uh, oftentimes we think of chinese as being part of the california gold rush or the transcontinental railroad but really chinese really began their global explorations quite early you know thousands uh, of years ago or at least uh, seven or 800 years ago in the 1400s, the uh, treasure fleet of Chang He uh, sent out by the uh, Ming emperors uh, led him to explore Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, the Indian Ocean, all the way over to the Arabian Peninsula and the African coast. So the Chinese early on were no strangers to traveling to foreign lands. Uh, the uh, Spanish uh, uh, Acapulco to Manila trade that began in the 1500s uh, was the beginning of the exploitation of labor from Asia by the European colonial powers. So we began to see uh, house servants in the Americas. We began to see entrepreneurs, barbers, and uh, other uh, uh, merchants and shopkeepers setting up shop in the Americas by as early as the 1600s. By the 1700s, the, uh, there were Chinese that had uh, landed in Baltimore in the Americas. Uh, a crew landed in uh, on Vancouver Island at Nootka Sound in 1788, a crew of 70 built a village and then built the first uh, European vessel uh, built in the Americas. By the 1840s, the European powers that had established plantations in the Caribbean and in South America, such as in Cuba and Jamaica, uh, freed their African slaves. So they found a replacement labor pool it, with the Chinese, the uh, South Asian Indians, and others to work in the sugar and tobacco plantations. 
So with the Chinese coming to America to work on these in the fields, then there began to be a, um, an entrepreneurial community that, that started, that followed. Uh, there was a supply chain, you know, who would bring the food, the supplies, all the uh, necessary goods, the herbs uh, to support the thousands of workers who were in the Americas. Uh, there were other uh, Chinese who were in early California. Uh, baptismal records at the California missions show that Chinese actually were baptized uh, as uh, were of course, you know, Native Americans and others too, but Chinese names uh, are among those records. And of course, you know, I'm moving down to the 19th century now with the California gold rush, there were definitely many Chinese who came over here hoping to uh, find their fame and fortune, uh, but also many found uh, uh, much success in many other enterprises, uh, many, migrated here to take advantage of the rich fishing off the coast of California and in San Francisco Bay. There were many who came to work in agricultural development. Uh, many Chinese helped drain the swamps. The Swamp Act of 1860 enabled uh, the financing of uh, the draining of some of the Sacramento Delta, San Joaquin Delta uh, area lands. So many villages and towns sprung up as a result of Chinese workers uh, work, uh, clearing the, the land for agricultural development, which made it into one of the richest agricultural regions in the world. And of course, uh, in the 1860s, right at the time that the Civil War was raging in the East, Chinese started working on railroad construction in the West. Uh, so with all of this growth and development that was going on, um, it, was, it was inevitable that we would see a few Chinese start showing up in LA. Uh, the 1850 census did show uh, two Chinese in the area. In the 1850s and 1860s, a few dozen more arrived. By 1870, we saw a count of 172 Chinese in LA city proper, 234 in LA county. Uh, in 1861, a fellow named Chun Chik set up a, uh, uh, actually uh, paid for an ad in the Los Angeles newspaper that he was opening up a store. And as uh, Scott mentioned earlier, in 1870, uh, Dr. Chilong Tong or Jean Tong opened up shop in, an, uh, in the home of an American, uh, uh, William Abbott on Main Street in downtown LA. Uh, so there were Chinese definitely coming here, but there were also many reasons why they were leaving China. Uh, there were uh, civil wars, the Taiping Rebellion, the uh, Punti Hakka Wars in the 1850s and 1860s, basically uh, left millions, uh, well, had resulted in millions of casualties and many people leaving China to seek their fortune elsewhere. Uh, and of course there were parallel migrations in other parts of the world. Uh, there were English, there were Irish, French, Italians, uh, Jewish, Germans, uh, other folks who really migrated to California and the West. So LA was actually a very mixed and, and diverse area in the 1850s and 1860s. And of course that, that uh, diversity sometimes resulted in conflict and obviously uh, there were many reasons for that uh, particular uh, challenge that Chinese faced. You know, there were uh, uh, there was great opposition to Chinese labor, but also uh, one of the main reasons was really just simply about race. Uh, the fact that Chinese were from Asia, different from the Euros Europeans, and uh, perhaps uh, spoke a language that was far different. Uh, so that, that's something I'll, I'll get back to in, in, in just a moment. But anyway, the population of, of uh, Los Angeles, the Chinese population of, pop, of Los Angeles in Southern California continued to grow. So despite 18 Chinese being murdered, we saw uh, uh, Leonard Rose hiring hundreds of Chinese for his Sunny Slope Ranch uh, in 1872. 
Leonard Rose later uh, left, but his uh, town site that he left behind was called Rosemead. Um, in 1873 at Cajon Pass, 100 Chinese were brought in to build the road over the San Bernardino Mountains. If you drive to uh, Las Vegas or to Mammoth or to Death Valley or places north and you go over the Cajon Pass, think about that the next time when you're driving over that mountain pass. The Chinese built the first freight road that went over those mountains. Uh, many other road builders uh, came. Uh, the Washburn Road in 1874, connecting Wawona to uh, the southern part of Yosemite Park to the Yosemite Valley. Uh, the uh, the uh, Great Sierra Wagon Road in the 1880s was also built by uh, 200 Chinese in the dead of winter, by the way, 56 mile road up at, at a, a very extreme elevation. There were many other Chinese who worked on other roads in California. Uh, back in LA, uh, our, our small town grew uh, in 1876, just five years after the massacre, a Chinese Presbyterian mission was started. Also a Chinese Methodist mission was started. So the first Chinese business was established in Pasadena in 1876. That was basically the, the centennial year for the US. So uh, all through Southern California, there was continued growth in Riverside, Chinatowns emerged uh, in San Bernardino, in Colton, in Redlands. We began to see uh, Chinatowns develop. So in the decade of the 1870s, following the massacre, our LA Chinese population actually multiplied by three and a half times and even more by 1890. In the larger, in the hinterland, in the larger part of LA County, the numbers grew even more simply because of the many who were working out in the uh, unincorporated areas of LA County. Of course, there was a backlash. And as you, you heard, uh, there were anti-Chinese rallies in San Francisco, the, the Sandlot rallies led by Dennis Kearney and the Working Men's Party in the 1870s uh, led to the adoption by the California State Legislature of a new constitution in 1879, one that prohibited the hiring of Chinese for public works projects and that prohibited corporations from hiring Chinese. So there were obstacles that our early Chinese faced. And then even beyond that, the federal government, the, the US Congress passed the 1882 Exclusion Act. And that led to a long period of driving out of Chinese from many small towns and uh, uh, rural areas. Ironically, that led to actually the continued growth of LA Chinatown and some of the larger communities. But nevertheless, you know, we, we saw the pain. 1885, Rock Springs, Wyoming, uh, 27 Chinese murdered. In uh, uh, the Snake River Canyon, uh, 35 Chinese were murdered in uh, 1887 uh, and on and on. Chinese were driven out of Pasadena in 1885. There was a China, small Chinatown near the corner of Fair Oaks and Colorado. And uh, Chinese, that Chinatown was forced to relocate. And you know, you 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 wonder. Well, was it really such a threat? Think about this: in uh, the uh, latter part of the 19th century, Chinese immigrated. Chinese immigration uh, was, represented only two to four percent of total immigration. European immigration actually was. Uh, represented 80 to 90% of total immigration. So were, were the Chinese here uh, posing a threat to uh, other workers? That's, that's something for history to consider. Anyway, uh, let, let me quickly uh, move on. Our, our Chinese community continued to grow in LA. Uh, some organizations were created as a um, result of that growing population. The Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association was 
a uh, a uh, an organization that was created as an umbrella entity to uh, help resolve disputes and conflicts between some of the family associations. Uh, you know, many of the Chinese family associations, of course, were based along family lines, sometimes along labor lines. You know, the laundry workers had their own association, or the grocery vegetable workers had their own association. Uh, and there were other less than legal enterprises, of course, you know, we all hear about opium dens and, and, and gambling joints. Uh, but that was common also in the other communities. Uh, it wasn't exclusive to the Chinese. Anyhow, the, the uh, Chinese uh, Consolidated Benevolent Association uh, started in 1889 and it still continues today. In the, uh, near the end of the 19th century, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance got its start in 1895. It was uh, reorganized in 1904. The LA chapter L was established in 1912. Uh, some of the early leaders of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance were, uh, Walter Yu Lam and Y.C. Hong. Walter Yu Lam in San Francisco, Y.C. Hong in LA. They were both advocates for Chinese American civil rights who uh, went to our legislatures, went to the US Congress to fight against Chinese exclusion. So we had our heroes in our community. You know, Our community was not helpless, but rather the um, the resources were there to, to fight back. Both the CCBA, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and the Chinese American Citizens Alliance occupied the Garnier building in old LA Chinatown. Uh, it, it was a building that was built in 1890 by Philippe Garnier for his uh, Chinese tenants. And uh, as a um, uh, result of the continuing efforts by the CACA uh, and others in 1943, Chinese exclusion was finally repealed after a period of 61 years, 61 years of Chinese exclusion. That meant that if you were trying to immigrate, you faced many, many challenges. Uh, not that that some folks didn't get around, uh, didn't get around that, uh, like my own grandfather, for example, got his papers early on in 1890. Uh, and like many of my, my uh, contemporaries, you know, this is how we all got here. Anyway, uh, the problem was that the Garnet building was uh, among the many buildings that were condemned by the state of California in the 1950s. Now, just before that, let me back up for a second here. Uh, half of uh, Chinatown, half of old Chinatown, uh, which had expanded from the original Calle de los Negros uh, location, half of old Chinatown, uh, numbering about 1,500 to 2,000 residents, was, uh, was uh, demolished to make way for Union Station. The other half was destroyed by the state of California to make way for the 101 freeway. And that latter displacement resulted in the CCBA and the CACA being forced to move out of the Garnier building. So um, the, the organizations are still around and they relocated to new Chinatown, but there are some existential threats today. You know, the community has been able to survive the displacement of the 30s and the 50s, uh, but now we're facing some other uh, threats and it's something that to, uh, to be watchful for. Um, there are city zoning and planning policies, which open the door for land development, or rather somewhat uncontrolled land development. Uh, there, the downtown, uh, the DTLA 2040 community plan, which is on the table right now for consideration, uh, will support dense development, which is good in places, but it also poses a threat to some historic structures and to the way of life in the community. Uh, 
there is also a redistricting threat uh, where with the uh, most recent census, there are uh, new boundaries that could be drawn that could carve up Chinatown and it would uh, take out key blocks out of Chinatown. So um, I'm gonna close and I, don't, I know that you probably have some questions and we can talk a little bit more, but I'd like to ask uh, Ashley or uh, Rochelle, could you show some of the final slides here? So I, I just want to I close with a few images which will help you uh, get a, a picture of where Chinatown is today. Uh, this is actually an ad by Dr. Jean Tong, who was open for business in 1870. And you can see that he, uh, as I mentioned earlier, he had his store in the house of William Abbott on Main Street. That unfortunate, and he was also a labor contractor. He uh, supplied uh, workers for uh, households you know, who wanted a cook, who wanted a gardener. They were, uh, if you ran a restaurant and needed a cook, why uh, you would go to Dr. Tong. Anyway, uh, he was one of the early victims of the massacre of 1871. Next, please. The, I mentioned the Garnier building built in 1890. This was the civic center of Chinatown in the 1890s and in the early 1900s. Uh, housed on the second floor were the CCBA, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, and the CACA, uh, Chinese American Citizens Alliance. And by the way, my, my dad lived on the second floor too. There was housing uh, in the second floor. Uh, next, please. And uh, I'm sorry, let me forget, let me back up. Yeah, so the, uh, the Garnier building is presently the home of the Chinese American Museum, and we're proudly sharing the history, early history of Los Angeles Chinatown. Now, just to the left of the photo across the street from Los Angeles is the original location of Calle de los Negros, the site of the Chinese massacre of 1871. And that is why we at the Chinese American Museum uh, continue to commemorate this event of 1871. Next, please. We try to reclaim our history in, in many different ways. Uh, and the Chinese American community has been disturbed by the fact that the joining of the rails in Utah, uh, the completion of the first trans transcontinental railroad did not show Chinese in the photo. You know, the workers who, who built the railroad didn't, uh, were not invited to the ceremony. So it, at the uh, 2019 anniversary, the 150th anniversary of the completion of the rails, of the joining of the rails, many Chinese came and were photographed at, with locomotives behind them to uh, commemorate this important uh, event in our nation's history. Next, please. Chinese Americans fought in many wars for the US. They fought in the Civil War on both sides. They fought in the Spanish-American War in World War I and in World War II. Just recently in 2018, a congressional bill was signed, which authorized the issuance of a Congressional Gold Medal to recognize the role of Chinese Americans, of 20,000 Chinese Americans who fought for this country in World War II. There had been previous recognition of Japanese American veterans, Filipino American veterans, and, uh, and Navajo co-talkers, and of course, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen too. So this, past year has been a period of recognition by many organizations across the country, including the Los Angeles CACA in the uh, recognition of Chinese American World War II veterans. Next, please. So how do we uh, reclaim our history? Part of it is that we don't have enough information. Our youth are not learning enough about our diverse history. And the 
California legislature just recently passed a, uh, a resolution requiring our school curricula to have ethnic studies. And uh, it, it will be a period of time before it becomes mandated in all schools and before all materials are going to be available. But tomorrow, uh, if you uh, listen in on our um, educational program, you'll, you'll see, you'll learn a little bit about some of the educational um, uh, lesson plans that are being prepared for use by our schools. Next, please. Further reclaiming our history is to try and protect and recognize some of our historic places. This includes uh, not only places within our, our cities and, and communities and villages, but also out in the mountains and the rural areas. Chinese were in the, in the Sierras, uh, were harvesting timber. Uh, they were uh, building roads, as I mentioned earlier, but in Yosemite, uh, like in Yosemite National Park, uh, Chinese served as cooks and also as laundry people. So a laundry building that had been uh, vaca vacated and then uh, used as a storage building for many years and forgotten has finally been reclaimed, has finally uh, reasserted its place in history thanks to the efforts of Ranger Yan Yan Chan uh, on the left, and then Jack Shu, in the, who is a uh, former state parks uh, educational uh, ranger in the blue. But uh, just on October 1st of this year, uh, just this month, uh, the, there was ribbon cutting for the Chinese laundry building. So by having a facility like this to educate our community, then we are learning and remembering our history. And next, please. And I think this is the last one. Uh, the uh, community of Chinatown is always trying to find ways to solve its uh, challenges, how to, how to maintain our, our community. And recently, the city's uh, redistrict commission recognized the, the protests of many people for an effort to try and carve out a piece of LA Chinatown and put it into another district. So that was a victory. The, the, the Redistricting Commission uh, approved keeping it in Chinatown. And so one of the things that we have to recognize is that the price of, of uh, equality and freedom is really eternal vigilance. And that's it. So thank you for listening. I'll turn you back to Gabe. Thank you, Eugene, for the, the historical and longtime development of the Chinese in Los Angeles, in California, and also in the nation. Uh, I would now like to introduce Kevin Waite's video. We're sad that Kevin can't be with us, but we understand the importance of sleep. So we're very appreciative of the fact that he sent us a special video to show. So please, uh, this is Scott, wait. Hi everybody, and thanks for the introduction, Gay. Um, first, I wanna make an apology for being here uh, via re uh, a recording rather than live. Um, it's a little after 1 a.m. in England right now, and unfortunately I have to be up uh, early to lecture to my students. That said, it's an enormous honor to be speaking to you all tonight at the beginning of what promises to be a really rich uh, and memorable week of programming. And so I want to thank Gay and Michael and Rochelle and everybody at CAM for making it all happen and for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's also a huge honor to be speaking side by side with Eugene Moy, uh, one of the foremost experts on LA's Chinese American community, and with Scott Zesch, whose book on the Chinese massacre should really be on all of our bookshelves. Um, and I'll just say here that Scott's book is far and away the most important work on the subject. And it deeply informed my own writing on this period in California history. And as he does so well, Scott and his remarks brought us right to this moment and to this place in LA 
in October, 150 years ago. And now it's my job to sort of pull the camera back, so to speak, and give us a wide angle view of the United States as a whole during this period. Uh, because as Scott suggested, what happened in LA in October 1871 didn't take place in a vacuum. It belongs to a much bigger, uh, much broader story. Um, and with that, I'm going to start the slideshow. Uh, and, and so that really is the thesis of my talk. Yes, the carnage of October 24th, 1871 was localized. It struck uh, LA's Chinese immigrant community and it produced the 19 victims who are rightly at the focus of our commemorations this week. But the forces that motivated that massacre were national. It emerged from political currents sweeping across the entire country in the years following the Civil War, from the former Confederate States of the South all the way to the Pacific Coast. So to paraphrase something Gay once told me, what we're commemorating this week isn't just a Los Angeles story or a California story or just a Chinese story. It's an American story. And so it's incumbent on all of us to understand and to learn from the events of October 24th, 1871, because they resonate today. Uh, so I'm going to attempt a, a 15 minute crash course on the history of American race relations in the Reconstruction era in order to sort of situate the Los Angeles Chinese massacre in its broader context. Uh, and this talk is in some ways an extremely condensed version uh, of a book of mine that came out this April, uh, which is to say, uh, if you want to understand even more about this moment and its legacies, you can find the book on Amazon or better yet from your favorite independent bookstore. Uh, and that I promise is the one and only shameless plug that I'm gonna make for my book. So the story of the LA Chinese massacre begins uh, oddly enough on the other side of the continent and with a very different group of oppressed people. It begins in the former slave states of the Confederate South in 1865. The end of the Civil War that year and the collapse of the Confederacy brought freedom to roughly uh, 4 million uh, formerly enslaved African Americans. It was this moment of profound hopefulness, uh, a chance to make good at last on the promises that had been enshrined in the Declaration of Independence that, quote, all men are created equal and that they have certain inalienable rights. Not only did the end of the war bring freedom to these African-Americans, it also brought an emboldened and a remarkably broad-minded, at least by the standards of the time, a group of politicians to Congress. So for the next five or so years, Congress introduced and passed some of the most racially progressive legislation that the nation had ever seen. Uh, and to highlight just a few laws, there was the 14th Amendment, which defined citizenship for the first time, uh, and gave crucial rights and protections to virtually all Americans. Uh, and then the 15th Amendment, which gave Black men uh, across the country the right to vote. And it's hard to overstate uh, the promise of this moment, what the historian Eric Foner calls, quote, an unprecedented experiment in interracial democracy. But of course, none of those gains came without a fight. Uh, the white Southerners who once claimed these African-Americans as property were deeply, uh, deeply unsettled by this new racial order, to say the very least. And so they essentially uh, waged a guerrilla war against this very fragile interracial democracy. So uh, over the next decade, a series of brutal race riots would erupt in cities and towns across the South. Uh, New Orleans, Memphis, Colfax, and in a bunch of other locations. And the victims were almost always the recently emancipated Black people who lived in these places. Now, the, the most notorious and familiar example of this backlash is, of course, the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK was basically a, a network of white vigilantes who used terror, uh, so beatings, arson, rape, murder, 
to intimidate African Americans from claiming their new rights. And sadly, we'll probably never know the true scale of this carnage uh, because so much of the violence against Black people went unreported. Now, most of you are probably familiar to varying degrees with this history, right? Uh, we all got versions of it um, in our schools and in our history textbooks. But this period, uh, what we call the Reconstruction Era in American history, is always uh, about the South and about the brutal struggles that took place there. Um, and so it's essentially a regional history, right? So the question for us is, what do the struggles of recently emancipated Black people on the other side of the country have to do with the immigrant Chinese community in California? And the short answer is that this violence uh, or this violent white backlash that gripped the South spilled into the West as well, where racist vigilantes found new targets. Now, California had a, a very, very small black population in 1870, which amounted to, to just about 1% of the state's total population. Much larger uh, and much more menacing in the eyes of a lot of Californians was the Chinese population, which stood at about 10% of the state's total population and about 25% of the state's total workforce. So as you move west in the post-Civil War era, uh, racial anxieties were effectively transplanted from African-Americans and onto Chinese immigrants. And often the perpetrators of this violence in California adopted the same strategies and even the same names of terrorist groups within the South, including uh, the Ku Klux Klan. Now, this isn't really a history that gets taught in our schools. Um, the common consensus is that the Klan didn't emerge in the American West until well after the Reconstruction era, not until the 1920s, in fact. But as I was doing research for my book, uh, I identified over a dozen attacks committed by a California variant of the KKK. Uh, and the victims were never African-Americans. They were almost always Chinese immigrants or their white employers. Now, these Klan attacks on Chinese people took a number of different forms. Self-identified Klansmen sent violent messages through the mail, uh, threatening to disembowel their political enemies. They attacked Chinese workers in a series of raids on ranches in Northern California, uh, and they attacked places where Chinese people gathered and worshiped. So arsonists burned down a church in San Jose that housed a Sunday school for Chinese children. Uh, they tor torched another church in Sacramento, uh, as well as a brandy distillery near San Jose that employed Chinese people. Now we have to wonder, uh, why aren't we ever taught about this early California variant of the KKK? And uh, I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, first, it has to be conceded that this wave of Klan violence in California uh, was minuscule compared to the orgy of beatings and killings that took place in the South during Reconstruction. Second, uh, there's no evidence to suggest that California Klansmen coordinated with the KKK in the former Confederate states. Uh, the Klan during this period was this diffuse and, and relatively disjointed organization. Um, so for instance, those iconic pointy robes that are now basically the uniform of white supremacy, uh, those were really the product of the 20th century and not the 19th century. So instead of coordinating, uh, vigilantes in 19th century California simply adopted the banner of the KKK because they knew that the name alone inspired terror. And they were, after all, in the business of creating terror. But maybe the most important explanation for why historians have missed this early history of the KKK in California is that victims of Klan violence uh, in California look very different, right? They don't match the description of the typical victim that we associate with this period. Uh, because they were Chinese and not African-American, they don't really fit the standard narrative of this era in American history. 
Now, the important thing to remember is that these Klan attacks in California weren't isolated incidents perpetrated by lonely vigilantes. Uh, this violence belonged to a much broader anti-Chinese hysteria that really gripped California during this period uh, and that reached into the very highest echelons of power within the state. So in 1867, the Democratic Party in California rode to a stunning electoral victory on an explicitly anti-Chinese and anti-Reconstruction platform. Uh, and here you can see a piece of Democratic propaganda from that campaign, which is basically accusing their Republican opponents of allowing non-white people to climb to the top of the racial hierarchy. Uh, and you can see a caricature of a Chinese person is towards the top of this ladder. Uh, you'll also see that even a monkey is prepared to uh, climb up next. So obviously a brutally racist piece of campaign art, but the thing is it worked. Democrats captured majorities in the state legislature and California's congressional delegation, and they won the governorship. And this new democratic governor, Henry Haight, knew exactly which buttons to push with his white voters. So in his inaugural address, uh, he targeted the issue of Chinese immigration in particular. He claimed that the influx of Chinese workers would quote, inflict a curse upon posterity for all time. California Democrats followed this 1867 victory by doing something remarkable. They refused to ratify the two most important laws of the Reconstruction era, the 14th and the 15th Amendments that I mentioned earlier. And they did so by essentially making both amendments a referendum on Chinese immigration and Chinese suffrage, uh, even though both laws were really designed to protect and empower African Americans rather than Chinese immigrants. So California Democrats claimed falsely that the 15th Amendment would extend the vote to all Chinese people, when in fact, uh, Asian immigrants were still barred from both suffrage and citizenship. Willie Gwynn, uh, a California state senator who also happened to be a former Confederate soldier, argued that the reconstruction of the South would be replicated in the West thanks to this 15th Amendment. Quote, the only difference will be the substitution uh, of the Chinaman for the Negro. That's what Willie Gwynn said. With this logic, California became the only free state in the nation to reject both the 14th and the 15th Amendments. Now, uh, both amendments became national law because they, uh, they achieved the necessary ratifications from two thirds of the other states. But Californian, uh, California's rejection of these amendments sent a powerful message nonetheless. And the California legislature wouldn't extend a token ratification of the 14th and the 15th amendments until 1959 and 1962 respectively. Which is all to say, uh, anti-Chinese hysteria was an extremely powerful political weapon in reconstruction era California. And that's, uh, that's where I'm gonna leave us, essentially on the eve of October 24th, 1871. And from this perspective, I hope you can see uh, how the Los Angeles uh, Chinese massacre wasn't just a local affair, nor was it some sort of aberration in American history. It belongs rather to a national uh, racial reordering and a national white supremacist backlash of the Reconstruction era of this post-Civil War period. And it helps us to see how some of the major crises of this era, uh, which again, our history textbooks uh, generally describe as problems you know, unique to the American South, really reached across the entire continent. Uh, and that's basically the theme of my talk um, and of my book as a whole. It's uh, essentially an attempt to complicate our understanding of America's racial politics. Too often, American history is rendered in black and white. Um, and that's especially true of this post-Civil War period. But if we shift our geography, and if we root ourselves in California, rather than say, South Carolina, we get a much richer perspective, I think, 
uh, on our shared history. And we get some important lessons as well, that bigotry can't be quarantined to one region or confined to a single ethnic group, that assaults on one group of vulnerable people can easily be transferred to another, and that to combat bigotry and white supremacy, campaigns for racial justice must be as broad and diverse as possible. That was all true 150 years ago, and it's still true today. Thank you. I want to thank all three speakers for presenting these valuable insights and information to us tonight. Because they shared so much, we're really running short on time. So I'd like to invite uh, Scott and Eugene to come back to us, but not in terms of summing up. I want to at least ask one or two questions that, um, that our audience really wanted to hear your answers. The first question is, and it kind of follows what Kevin ended up by saying too. The first question is, what do you say to people that say, oh, that happened in the 1800s. These aren't the times we're living in now and it won't happen again. Um, how do you address that comment? Well, which of us first? Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, I, I, I was just going to say, Gay, um, in the, the part of my book that has not aged well is the last three or four pages in which I addressed some attacks that were happening in 2008, 2009, 2010 on people in marginalized communities. And I think the things we have seen in the last 10 years, so many of them are so much worse that um, the examples in my book pale by comparison. And so, you know, I think the idea this can't happen again is extremely dangerous. And that's why we have to keep telling these stories and drawing parallels to modern times. Thank you, Scott. Eugene, do you have comments? Uh, just quickly, uh, the, the anti-Asian discrimination and violence has continued to this day. And that's why we have organizations like LA versus hate in LA here, uh, or uh, we have a human relations commission that is addressing, as you're, you're familiar, Gay, uh, addressing uh, uh, issues in our communities and in our schools. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's never ending and we need to go beyond education and hopefully with at least public recognition of the errors of our past, you know, whether we, we, we mark places or we uh, teach people about the events of the past, it's, it's important. In, in, um, in the planning of this 150th anniversary commemoration, Every year we do one evening, which is the day of. This year, because it's 150th anniversary, staff wanted to do more. So we started out saying, oh, let's do three days. Then the three days grew to five days and the five days grew to eight days. And the reason is during this time, as we're looking more and more into this heinous, um, massacres and hate crimes in the past and in the present, we're digging up more and more, such as the Tulsa massacre, such as the Antioch burning of Chinatown, such as other massacres. Wounded knee. <laughs> exactly, yeah. wounded knee. And so it's to the point where history has to be rewritten because none of these incidents were ever taught to us in the so-called mainstream histories that we learned growing up in the US. So the other question then is beyond acknowledging these incidents, these massacres, these racist laws, 
that's been happening. What do you think is an appropriate way to commemorate and memorialize these types of racist historic events? Eugene, you want to go first this time? I, I'm, I'm not sure how to address that. Why don't you go ahead, Scott? Scott? OK. Um, I don't know that I can address necessarily the most appropriate memorial, but uh, if it's OK, I would like to address different ways to try to uh, teach these stories to a wider group of people. If, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Um, you know, I think a lot of these incidents have been well documented in the academic literature, but I really think that popular culture and the arts is one way to bring these stories to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. A few months ago, I read a column by Tom Hanks about how the film industry in particular should tell a wider variety of American stories. And I think the same could be true of fiction. I think these stories can be told on stage. We have Tom Jacobson's play about the Chinese massacre through dance and music. Uh, there was a good example of that in the beautiful performance on the plaza yesterday afternoon and also through visual arts. And I think artists and writers can sometimes provide the emotional context of these incidents uh, that gives them the ability to perhaps reach and touch more people than we can as historians. Thank well, you so much. Yep. And for those of you who are interested in the rest of our programming leading up to next Sunday's memorial event, please look at our links that are visible in your chat uh, box. And I just really want to thank Scott and Eugene and Kevin over there in, in, in the UK for participating tonight, especially in kicking off the informational panel to set the tone for us for the rest of the week's programming. I, I hope that you will join us for the rest of this week's programming. The subject is important. The outreach is important. The getting the word out is important because many of these stories have been covered up for so long, for so many years. And if it needs us pushing it open and pushing the stories open, then that's what we need to do. Thank you for joining us. Have a good evening and we'll see you tomorrow night.